Hello, everyone, and welcome to Bill of Rights Institute Teacher Time. I am Liz Evans. I am one of your co-hosts, and we're so excited to have you here today. We have a wonderful guest. We are going to be talking about summer and what summer is like for teachers, and it's our season finale, which I cannot believe it's already June. So as always, we'd love to hear from you. Please, you know, answer questions in the chat, ask questions. We really want this to be a experience for teachers, not just for the three of us. So I am joined as always uh, by my co-host, Gary Coletti. Hi, Liz. Thanks so much. Yeah, it is strange. Time is a very strange thing. And here we are at the uh, at the end of this season. I can't believe it. Uh, but that really is our theme for the day, right? Transitioning into what we're calling summer. Um, and you're absolutely right. If this is the first time you're watching this, this is meant to be an interactive. We will have your questions and comments uh, forwarded to us. And so uh, if you've got something uh, that's relevant to what we're talking about, we'd love to chat with you. Uh, that's what Teacher Time is all about, right? Trying to connect teachers across the country uh, and something that that is uh, in common is is the existence of summer and to have us uh, to help us through this conversation we're, we're thrilled that our really our main guest is Molly Schneider Molly would you mind introducing yourself to the teachers of the world yeah no problem um, my name is Molly Schneider I just completed my 13th year of teaching um, actually today is technically our first day of summer break wow. um, I teach at Notre Dame Cathedral Latin School in the suburbs of Cleveland Ohio um, in the past several years, I've taught AP U.S. History and a dual enrollment American government and politics class. And I'm also um, coming up on concluding my second year on the Bill of Rights Institute Teacher Council. So I am super excited to be here today. That's fantastic. That's wonderful. I mean, I mean, first of all, what timing having this be that that first day of this. It's really what our theme is. Again, our question really is what what are summers like for teacher? What is what we call summer mode, which is just that way of, of being. But uh, but your all these experiences of all the classes you have and teacher council and all of these, I'm, I, I'm sure they'll they'll inform what we talk about today. So again, if this is your first time, we have a series of segments. Uh, feel free to jump in if, if you're out there with your questions or comments uh, in the chat. But if it's okay with everybody, our first segment usually is to take a look at what's going on in the world with a question of how might it affect a classroom, whether or not you're still in class or, or thinking about how you're preparing for the future. And we like to call that with a news cycle. So what we do is devoted a couple of minutes to just say, what's going on out there and how might it be relevant or, or something that teachers would consider? So um, I will start because tomorrow marks the second drawing in the state of Ohio's program that they're calling Vax a Million um, to incentivize Ohio residents to get the, the COVID-19 vaccine. They are entering anyone who's gotten at least their first shot into a million dollar lottery. And they're doing five of these drawings. The first one was last week. And um, the next one was drawn today, but then they're verifying it and it'll be announced tomorrow night. Um, and in addition to that $1 million, they are also offering anyone under the age of 18 to be entered into this lottery to receive um, full tuition, full year scholarship, room and board, books, everything to any of the state schools in Ohio. If, um, so there'll be five of those um, scholarships that will be um, auctioned off or uh, um, offered to anyone who's received the vaccine there. Um, and, and I think it is kind of interesting because it brings into that idea of, well, what's, is, what's gonna get people getting the vaccine? Is it mandates or is it going to be incentives like these lottery um, drawings that I know a couple other states are doing something very similar as well. Um, but I know some of the statistics that have come out in some of the, the Ohio news sources and nationally have said that there was a 33% increase in the number of Ohioans who received the vaccine after they announced this lottery. And then they looked at that same time period and saw that there was about a 20% increase in the state of Ohio compared to nationwide, there was about a 10% decrease in individuals getting the vaccine at the same time. So fingers crossed, maybe we'll be a lucky winner come tomorrow night or in any right. of the four drawings that happen afterwards. That's so interesting because it really just illustrates the state's differences in rollout of, you know, the vaccine. And, you know, I live in the state of Arizona, which we don't have any incentive programs 
I feel like though the state of Arizona, I mean, rolled it out in a very efficient manner. So it's, it's an interesting look at, um, you know, the CDC recommending something and then how states take it and decide to roll it out, which I think is a very interesting thing, especially to explore in a classroom, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think about how the, the, general topic of the uh, of the coronavirus and, and pandemic and, and what happened is is almost becoming chapters now maybe that's the like lesson planner of me uh you know there was the what is it it was very sciencey at first and then it sort of morphed and now i feel like the chapter is about incentives and rollout and vaccines and i mean it, it was only months ago that vaccines were just a theory that we knew were coming at some point but now it's how are they getting rolled out and, and so forth and just watching this story on fold has become it's a different kind of news item because it's almost been a constant news item for a year and yet the the manner in which it is news uh you're right is 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 significant and different and i guess it is the history teacher in me that always thinks what will this look like 10 20 years from now when it is being studied right what parts of this ongoing story that's part of our every day will there be i mean i i think about those cards as being that's the kind of artifact that would be amazing to look like de decades hence, you know, and say, okay, oh, here's, here's one of those cards, you know, that, uh, you know, is from a historical event. Um, speaking of historical events, I know we're also at the beginning of June. It's, by the way, we're recording this beginning of June <laughs> um, for those watching. Uh, and so um, uh, there's a couple of things. One, it is Pride Month. Uh, and so that, you know, I do always associate that with, with June and, and the heat coming in the summer, because I get them from the, from the Northeast, but um, um, how that, the significance of that for classrooms and for teachers, whether or not you're in the classroom, what do you all think of, of how that has, has developed in, in the time that you've seen being a teacher? I feel like for me, you know, it wasn't something that I was really aware of. And I think when I think back to like first and second year teacher, Liz, who is just trying to survive curriculum, it wasn't really something that, you know, we talked about and was taught. And as I learned more as a teacher, and then, you know, you, you're talking about how you go into lesson planning mode, Gary, I always go into Supreme Court mode. So mm -hmm. even when you're talking about vaccines, I'm like, hmm, there's been some vaccine, like Supreme Court things, but even you know, a couple of years ago, uh, when there was the civil rights case with the transgender um, female who was fired, even things like that, it is American history in itself is so complex. And there are so many webs and so many different facets. And I never wanted to teach something that I wasn't comfortable teaching, not com comfortable teaching in a sense of like, I know enough about this to at least like give you a baseline, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, when we have things like, we just fi finish um, Asian American Pacific Islander month, or we have Black History Month, the more that those months are celebrated and we learn things, the more that they just kind of intertwine in curriculum. And that is something that as I've, you know, been the student of history, cause I'm still a student of history, um, I've really appreciated being a part of and learning about. What about you, Molly? Yeah, um, and I, I like how, Liz, you brought up the the Supreme Court decisions, because I remember just um, a few years ago when the Obergefell decision came down, and being on vacation and just remember hearing about that and, and having all of the news stations covering that and knowing people in my life that that would specifically impact. And and there was this, this, this feeling that like experiencing it in a way that you knew it was something very historical and you knew that it does kind of impact the way we approach some of these topics in our classrooms. Um, once we finished the AP US history exam, I feel awful if I were to give them another exam during exam week. So they did a project this year where they took the, the American Pageant textbook and they had to revise a chapter and include more stories and include what is missing out in some of those books. And in the chapters that were about the 60s and 70s, I had a couple of groups that were really focusing on the gay rights movement and, and really looking at kind of the impact of Stonewall and impact of kind of a lot of the, the movement around that. And so it, it's kind of very interesting because it's something that you, you hear and you kind of experience personal lives, you see it in the news, but then you kind of reflect on how you want that to be covered in your, your curriculum and with your students as well. 
And I always appreciate too, like looking at laws, like you talk about Obergefell, um, I always had my students read Justice Roberts' dissent and talking about, like when we talk about laws, it's not that the people who voted against Obergefell versus Hodges are against gay marriage, they're against the way the law is being applied. And I think when you start talking about, like, we're not here to talk about morals. That is not what my job is. My job is to teach you how to read law and how to kind of interpret it. Um, that that's really cool. Another thing is a lot of people right now are just starting to learn about the Tulsa race massacre. We're at a hundred years. Um, you know, Gary, you had mentioned, I wonder what people are going to talk about in, you know, 10 or 20 years with this, even learning things, I'm going to be honest, it wasn't until a couple of years ago that I knew that the Tulsa race massacre existed. And I think that one of the things I really appreciate about these months or these anniversaries is it gives us a more of an opportunity to learn. You know, there's been so many documentaries and, and amazing articles written that just help us understand and help our students understand the big complex web of history. And that's what those months and anniversaries, I think, help do for us. Yeah, I agree. There's there's almost a, an organic. I think I think it activates how many different people, different different organizations, um, you know, really care about history and, and telling the story of it. And so when you say that, absolutely, there's particularly when it comes to anniversaries. But there's something really nice if you're you know into. <laughs> I'm going to say it. You know history kind of nerding, where you have different organizations who have it on the cover of their magazines, do podcasts, do episodes, do, you know, lessons, there are new resources that are just there, that it becomes part of a national conversation in a really powerful way. And that's something that, you know, again, I'm very biased. I really like social studies. I think it's something social studies does though, right? It can, it can have all these different aspects be part of a conversation for people across the country. Yeah, I mean, and I think you could you could spend decades teach, teaching these materials. You can have advanced degrees in these these content areas, but there's always something else that you can learn. There's always a new perspective. Nobody sees the world the same way as somebody else. So I always appreciate um, when you have these commemorations and when you have closer look at these incidents that and and just like Liz, I didn't know a lot about. Um, what happened in Tulsa until I was what I would consider an adult. So, I mean, it, it, you appreciate being able to just kind of dive deeper into that. And I mean, just considering the topic of today's discussion, it, I really appreciate summer for those opportunities to be able to take a closer look, slow down and really kind of learn more about what I try to teach my students every single day. Molly, could not have asked for a better segue uh, to, to our next section, which is what we like to call the art and science of teaching. You know, respecting and honoring that teaching does have structures to it, a certain science to it, dates and, 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 and ways that you structure how you put together lessons and ideas and do research, but there's also an art. There's a, a personal, individualized way that teachers have their own approaches to things, make it their own, and really are artists. Uh, and so we, we really do take that seriously. And so, uh, um, you know, it, it, Molly, you're exactly right. Thinking about our theme of summer, that's sort of a question that we have, right? We have all these things floating around in our mind. So our, our question for this segment then is really what is summer for a teacher? And that can mean different things for teachers in different parts of the country. Um, are, are there expectations for teachers? What, is it, what does summer mean for teachers? Molly, I'm going to let you go ahead since you're, this is your first day of summer. All right. <laughs> well, um, especially after the school year. I mean, there's always that feeling when you are leaving the building for the last time to go home over the summer of being excited, of, of looking forward to what comes with summer. But I think on Friday and maybe perhaps some of Ohio's weather of 50 degrees and pouring down rain had something to do with it, but I was just a lot more tired. I mean, I was just more exhausted leaving the school building and thinking like, wow, this, this was the school year that just finished. Um, and I'm one of those teachers who I love taking advantage of every single professional development opportunity. It's an amazing time to be able to travel to various parts of the country and meet with um, like-minded teachers and just totally what I refer to sometimes as the nerd camps, right? Yeah. That you get to spend time with individuals just like you. But I think I purposely 
decided to do a lot less of it this summer and just really focus on resetting, um, just taking a time out. A lot of, as you had mentioned earlier, um, that like teachers just worked so much more throughout the school year and didn't have a lot of that time to themselves that maybe they purposely have. And, and so I think just really doing that this summer, recharging. Um, I like to do some lesson planning over the summer, but look at the classes that I'm going to be teaching from the, the long view, um, looking at what I want my overall themes to be in the class as, as I kind of reflect on what I did this year, what's the big issues, especially in government class, what's going to be like a good theme to focus on um, in the upcoming school year and just doing those those big big planning um, and trying to how I can revamp my classes reflecting on what really worked well and then just what I want to improve on when and, and the, the kind of planning you don't have time for in the normal school year. Um, I know just attending conferences or different workshops, you always get leave there in some of the sessions with a ton of stuff that you want to look at, but you don't have time to. So I kind of pull back some of those files and take a look at how I might incorporate some of that in the upcoming school year. So some some professional development, but this year much more of a reset um, okay. as I approach the next couple of months. Yeah, yeah that, I mean, that's very productive. That's, you know, I think that's it's productive in its own way, right? The, the reset, it's almost like you can, you know, you, you need to be able to do that. I think it's uh, not not only, you know, do you need it like physically to breathe, but also like your brain, right? I feel like sometimes doing something different can spark or activate or, or be parts of, uh, of things that, you know, you, you, you can't see coming and you can't, can't almost plan for it. It's almost like having to put yourself into situations that are not predictable for yourself at summertime. I think, uh, yeah, I definitely think uh, that's the case. I mean, summer to me for teachers in the experience I had with teachers I knew and, and, and being one was, it's just a different, it's just a different phase. It's a, it's a transition to a different kind of thing. It's not not teaching. It's just, it's that sort of planning and thinking, but also taking a break from, I mean, that was actually another episode that we had was, you know, what happens when you're like not thinking in the classroom, you're still doing this other thing, right? And, and sometimes that's a break from it. And sometimes that plays into the things you're doing. And I think summer was always like that. I mean, I, there were times, there was one summer, I, I'm going to tell a little anecdote where I spent, I spent it very much in nature. Um, and weirdly, the science of that probably became very useful in my classroom, just ways of thinking and stuff that I would not have done if I had just spent it in a different way. So, so yeah, summer can be, whether you like it or not, with, with the way our brains work, you know, kind of either, either recharging or, or activating different synapses. I don't know. Maybe I'm sounding wild, Liz. What do you think? <laughs> summer no, I think that I went through phases in my teaching career. I feel like at the beginning, you know, I was teaching summer school, <clears throat> excuse me. I was, I was expected actually to do a lot in the summer. And as mm -hmm. a life side note for anybody that does not know, teachers don't actually get paid in the summer. Most of mm -hmm. them spread their paycheck out. So they do get a paycheck. But they're not actually paid to do things. And you know, then I had my daughter and I feel like my life slowed down a little bit because I wanted to spend the summers with her. But now that she's getting older, I think 2016, I took five different professional development trips in the summer. Wow. And it was insane because our summer was only six weeks because we're modified year round. So I missed like the first week of school, like missing all these things, but I'm going to Stanford law school to study constitutional law, you know? And I think, you know, what Molly said, as you know, part of Gary and our, my job is we work with teachers and we get to see all these things. And uh, yesterday I hosted a Twitter chat and I'm like, it is Memorial day, but teachers are still, they want to learn. They want to share. They want to do all of these really cool things. And I think it's a valid thing for a year that you've worked. I said 2.5, you know, <laughs> times harder. Like it's not even a hundred percent harder. It is the constant shifting and moving that it is a thing because my husband's a teacher and my, I want to see him do nothing this summer because Gary, I think what you said holds a lot of weight. Sometimes when you just step back from something, you put your brain in a different scenario. That's where the good stuff comes from because your brain has the ability to be free. Um, I think, I mean, we go up to our family cabin in Jolo and I feel like every time I come back from that, because there's no internet. Our phones really don't work. 
I feel refreshed. And I think that yes, professional development is awesome. And that's what Gary and I do all summer, but it's also (laughs) nice to just not, and to show back up for your kids in July, August, September, whenever that is full, because you're a better teacher, then you can still be a better mom, a better friend, a better wife. I mean, whatever that looks like. And so I think that there's always an ebb and flow of what summer looks like during the teaching career. Yeah. Again, I mean, uh, this, it's, these, these are these are segues that are making themselves. But you mentioned the brain. That I think that's exactly right. Like it's it's there's a refreshing. Brains are wonderful, complex things that also needs <laughs> cultivation and you know uh, allowing it to go into wild directions. So that's the segment we have now. Brain break. Let's let's take a brain break right now. Let's model what we're talking about. The joy of taking a brain break. Um, for those just joining us or those out there watching, if you're watching live. Join us in the brain break. We're going to ask ourselves a question. Feel free to write your own answers uh, in in the chat and and we'll address them because I think it's a good question. Ready? Pure brain break question. What is your favorite thing to do in the summer? Molly. So I think definitely heading to the beach. Um, Always trying to go on vacation to the beach every summer. Um, We didn't last summer, so we're really looking forward to being able to do that this year. Reading um, that whole stack of books that I kind of accumulate throughout the year that I say, oh, yeah, I'll have plenty of time to read those. But a lot of the mindless reads as well, like those good beach reads that like um, that that are sometimes very predictable, but fun to read um, and, and, and doing that. Anything outdoors. We have, a, we have two boys, six and eight, that are just trying to get them outside and doing as much as possible outside, bike rides, hikes, all that stuff. We have some pretty cool parks in the area, including um, we live about 20 minutes from the, the Cuyahoga Valley National Park. So going on those trails as much as possible and just getting outside, especially in Ohio when the weather's not always beautiful every single day of the year. <laughs> I think for me, We talk about weather, like Arizona is so hot. It's just hot. Um, But we still, I mean, like getting outside, like we want, you know, we like to go swimming. I think my fondest childhood memory is we're going to my grandparents' house and going swimming. And then about mm, five o'clock, somebody would put something on the grill and we'd eat and then we go right back swimming. And, you know, you're so tired the whole summer, but it's because you're outside and you're, you're doing all of this. I do. I like to read. And we as a family like to travel. I mean, I think with every other Arizonan, we like to go to San Diego because that is our beach. Like we like to, you know, go do that. But I think that it's just the break in the schedule. That's my favorite thing about summer. I don't have to get up and like get my daughter ready. And there's not this like morning craziness. I think, you know, you you get to sleep in and it's just, it feels different. And I think that, you know, that's one of my favorite things to do in the summer is kind of nothing. Mm-hmm. Like you wake up and I mean, granted, I'm still working, but some days you wake up and you're like, I don't really want to, or I want to just read today. And it's like, great. <laughs> so I think that that's from, you know, from fall to spring in the teaching world is so hectic. Even the holiday break is hectic. And summer just does not have that. And that, you know, that's my favorite thing is it's just not. So I have a stack of books too, Molly, that have (laughs) nothing to do with history, nothing to do with political (laughs) science. I'll probably finish them in a couple of days. Very predictable. But to me, that's, and it's lighter longer. Mm -hmm. So it's not the like, you know, like, well, the sun's going down. It's time for dinner. It's time for bed. It's what time is it? Like, nobody knows what time it is. Yeah. Yeah. Time, like that idea of time not mattering. And um, I find myself making a lot less to-do lists um, that if I don't do it today, that's okay. Cause tomorrow we'll have plenty of time for that. And so that's very enjoyable. Hey, <laughs> Especially when your life is like a bell schedule, mm-hmm. right? Like right. the bell rings at this time and first hour and you have this like your life, I think for a while, my first couple of years teaching, I still heard bells or still moved through my day. Like I was teaching because I had learned that, Right. but I had lunch really quick. 
right? <laughs> Lunch was, I always got hungry at the same time. Yeah. Because that's what my, my body was like, it is time for you to eat and you have 15 minutes. So hurry up. <laughs> right. Yeah. My lunch was at 10 30, um, this year. So it's nice to know that like, Oh, I don't have to eat lunch at 10 30 in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> that's really funny. Yeah. Time is, time is a weird thing normally, but, but time in the summer is, is particularly, and it's interesting because you, you mentioned like a break and things like this, but to, to, to me, there's almost, a, there's a consistency too. So instead of like, there's, there's school time and then there's a break and then there's school time. It's almost, yeah. But what about the time to connect summers? Like, is there something that always, like, I think about that, right. I think about like, there's a particular fair that happens every summer. Right. And so it's almost this, like, not quite nostalgia, but almost this continuity of summers. Right. I, I, maybe I'm speaking as somebody who has a summer birthday. Right. Which on the one side means it was never acknowledged in school. So it's like I never aged to my classmates. But <laughs> when you have a summer birthday, like that's a marker of like you have a particular things you eat and smells and things. And summer has its own flavor and scent that you know you get associated with a particular particular ice pop on a particular day or you know that that you have these milestones in summer that connect each summer to themselves that it's almost like one continuous thing that school is almost a break of this right which is an interesting way of thinking about it and that's kind of how as a summer birthday person always thought of it that way um that summer is the continuous reality that gets interrupted by work you know period <laughs> which takes up 90% of the year, but, um, you know, you hold on to those couple of days that are summertime. Mm-hmm. I have Speaking a summer of- day too, Gary. And yeah, I, right? mine was always like, cause mine's in August and school always started right after. And it's like, I just want one day yeah. where I can bring cupcakes to my right. class. I got the cupcakes. You always get problems with the cupcakes. A, yeah. As a teacher, <laughs> even a high school teacher, I'm like, if it's your birthday, bring cupcakes. I never got cupcakes. <laughs> never did. And you're <laughs> promised it every year. Problem. Yep. <laughs> That's really funny. <laughs> Speaking of time being weird, uh, Molly, something we do, and for everyone out there, is uh, what we like to call the, um, we call it the seven minute stretch. This is uh, borrowed from baseball, but uh, we do use a watch. I will not interrupt mid sentence. I'm usually terrible about this. But the idea is to, to riff, to discuss for seven minutes straight um, on, a, on a topic. And again, we do invite the people who are watching, if you're out there watching right now, feel free to contribute to our seven minute stretch. Um, and this is again, another question that we're gonna cut off at seven minutes and just see if we can kind of drill down on it. You ready? Here is the question for our seven minute stretch how will you be spending this summer how is this summer different from years past so we've been talking about like summers in general in a lot of our conversations what about summer 2021 what does that look like that we maybe we haven't discussed already um I mean, so like I said previously, I'm not doing as much professional development and I'm kind of looking forward to that, to just having less days of, of um, work. But um, next week we're going on vacation. We're going to the beach in North Carolina nice. and um, we're stopping on the way down for about three days um, in Colonial Williamsburg. So we'll do the historic triangle, um, Jamestown, Yorktown, and Perhaps it's because their mom's a history teacher, but my sons do like the living history stuff. So um, it's kind of fun seeing some of that stuff that I enjoy, but seeing it through the eyes of a child um, and and seeing what they think is cool. When we asked my six-year-old what he remembers from the last time we went, he's like, the pool was amazing. So of course, but um, so, so really looking forward to a family vacation that we didn't do last year. And um, just kind of having that that normalcy return for myself, for my husband, for the boys, um, and then and then the rest of the summer just kind of doing whatever the, the the boys are doing, doing a couple of summer camps for them, and um, just doing a lot of staycation stuff. There's a lot of cool museums in the area, the zoo, that kind of thing, and um, like I said, just kind of rethinking some of the the classes that I will be teaching and and how I want to kind of revamp some of that stuff, what I want to keep, what I want to get rid of, but, but doing that at my own leisure and um, the, the fun planning, right? The, the, mm-hmm. the part that doesn't require a lot of, you got deadlines or you have to get this done and you have to get the, the hand, the stuff posted online, the handouts printed out and everything. So um, the, the creative thinking, I think it's it, summer is going to looking forward to that. And the idea of not having to worry about 
things getting done at a certain time and just going at my pace and chipping away at that, that book list. <laughs> yeah. That book list is great. How about you, Liz? I mean, it's different for me this year because I'll be traveling and, and working with teachers and I am, I cannot hide my excitement. I feel like working with teachers. I mean, when I left teaching, I did not leave teaching because I hated it. I love teaching. Like I love teaching AP government. I loved my kids. I loved my school. Um, but the ability to be able to work with teachers. And I think that, you know, Gary, you can probably speak on this too, are because I, when I started last year, it was at the beginning of the pandemic. And so we pretty much just did everything online, which is still great. Like, you know, you still get that from teachers, but there's something special about being together. And, you know, Molly, you said it like nerding out and being at these like professional developments. And, you know, this month I get, I'm going to be in three different States. And I think that that is, it's cool because I used to go to these PDs and now I get to be on the other side of it. And I mean, I loved teaching. I really, really did, but nothing energizes me honestly, more than working with teachers who have that passion. Like that is the coolest thing. And it speaks to, you know, people working in the summer, but they're doing things and they're wanting to learn. And I think that that is so cool. And we're, I mean, kind of like you, Molly, like we're looking forward to the fall and it's going to look different than it did last year. And we kind of got to, got to plan for it, but that plan doesn't need to be done right now. Right. We get to kind of take our time and think about it and talk about it. So I will say the one difference is we have a pool this year. Right. Having, not having a pool last year with a nine-year-old and a pandemic it, when it's like 110 degrees outside. So you can't really go outside. Um, but that's fun. So like today, you know, both my husband and my daughter are like, oh, after dinner, you want to go swimming? Like those are, that's, that's a little bit different for us so we can be outside more. But I think just working, working with teachers is a different part of my summer, but the one I'm most looking forward to. What do you think, Gary? No, that's exactly right. I mean, if the, if the question is, well, how does this summer look look obviously compared to last summer or past summers one I mean I think people I think teachers and ourselves included have gotten gotten real deft and real flexible and real optimistic like this coming fall sure it's going to be odd but compared to the past fall right I'm thinking about a summer not knowing it's like I, I feel like the phrase is bring it on mm -hmm. for whatever it's going to be now because I feel like now you know people are not being Nobody ever got bested, but now that now that people didn't get bested, mm -hmm. they can take on the the perhaps not fully. To me, when I was teaching, it got to the point where September was sort of you could really envision it, mm -hmm. and I, I don't know that's I don't think that's the case this year. But it's not as it's not as daunting in a strange way than it was a year ago. Mm -hmm. um, you know, to me and to the teachers who I've spoken to, I've I've heard nothing but optimism from teachers I've talked to across the country in the past couple of months for the coming fall. Mm -hmm. um, so that that's going to put a different spin on summer that I think is actually very optimistic. Um, I mean, you're right. If if you're asking personally, BRIs, we are we are a busy summer. Uh, we, we do things. We're going to have teachers here. We're going to have students here uh, in the D.C. metro area for our programs. We're going to be doing continuous programs throughout it. So um, but these are always voluntary. right? People want to be there. We're not making anybody do anything. And so there's a certain um, appreciation, I think, is the word. I think in years past, when you think about like, especially like visiting the DC metro area, there's things you take for granted, right? Oh, the museums are all there, and which museum, and there's something. Now you don't take that for granted. You, you appreciate, wow, you're open. You are allowing us in. There are people around. Uh, and already I'm seeing, I, I would say compared to three weeks ago, it looks different out the, outside the window here of people coming to DC for their summers uh, and, and, and tourism, which, had not really been it, it, it had been very different in the past year um so that this summer is it's almost like a refreshed version of something that we saw coming which is our normal programs again but not normal because we in a weird way appreciate them more if that makes sense so i think i think that's what it's like around here yeah that 100 percent makes sense and i love that you said like 
yeah, after last year, I feel like people are like, okay, I can pretty much do anything now yeah. like, in teaching. Like, because last summer it was like, I mean, we might go back. We might not like, it was always this big question mark. And even through the spring, I feel like yeah. it was a big, and now it's just like, I mean, okay, I'm going to rest in the summer. And then whatever you throw at me, I survived last year. So cool. This is going to be great. Yeah, exactly. Molly, do you feel the yeah. same? Yeah, absolutely. I just, I mean, thinking back to just conversations that I had last year and just things that there was just so much uncertainty, like even just like the communications that came from administration, I felt like, I mean, they had, I mean, to, to the best of their ability, they were just doing everything that they could, like, and just trying to um, get by. And so you don't feel that uncertainty this year. And so you do see excitement, um, just even, I know when we were dropping a son off at a birthday party last weekend, all the parents kind of stayed around and were just talking because <laughs> there wasn't as many of those those social gatherings as much. And so that that social connection that you that you can have the opportunity to do in summer that you you maybe don't have as much during the school year um, and looking forward to those being more meaningful and being more normal compared compared to last year where even just not like now I feel like the conversations people actually have stuff to talk about like even when like last year when you're talking to people nothing was going on nobody had like a lot of stuff to share so people are talking about their plans people are talking about kind of what would be normal conversations again and then that's really nice <laughs> absolutely yeah, and we love uh, we that that optimism is great, and and I look forward to to more hearing from teachers and ideas and and kind of that that motivation of uh, you're right the the unexpected I'm finding that too the unexpected conversations with people that you know it's you appreciate them more suddenly it's like I, I don't I, you might have been an acquaintance before now I want to talk to you a lot more than I probably would have normally so I, I love that I think that's great. Speaking of connecting with teachers, we're reaching our last segment. I can't believe it. Time moves on. This is it's actually kind of bittersweet for our final episode of this particular season. Um, but the end of our segment is uh, what we call our mailbag. Um, for those out there, by mail, you I, you could mail us something. Uh, our, our, our address is public. However, usually it's uh, email or uh, you may get to us through Twitter at, um, at BR Institute, hashtag uh, BRI Teacher Time, maybe through Facebook. We have lots of different ways you can get mail to us, whether it's electronic or whatnot. But uh, Liz and Molly, you have not seen this question. at the, uh, During our mailbag, we always like to ask a question uh, for, from out there that you've not seen before. Uh, they're usually very good questions. Uh, and so... Here's to put you on the spot. Here's a question for you. <clears throat> this comes from uh, M or J. Actually, it's unclear to me. Um, <laughs> has there been anything you discovered over the course of this school year, but didn't have time to get into that you want to explore more if you had more time? Weird question. It's, it's not a weird question, but it's sort of like, imagine like something you put a pin in, something over the course of this year that you discovered, but you didn't have time at the time that if you had more time, i.e. summer maybe, you might want to discover or more get more into anything from this year. It's a hard one. That's a tough one. <laughs> hard one. <laughs> um. Okay. Well, just just I'm thinking of something, and I don't know if it's the most exciting thing, but yeah. in the, the project that my AP students were doing and the revising, um, the one girl in the chapter in the '60s said, like, there's not that much in the space race here. And so um, she, she was talking about that. And then I was just listening to a podcast by uh, with that included an interview with an author who had just come out with a new book about John Glenn and um, getting into kind of his political career. And the, the author was making the argument that he probably would have made an excellent president, but he's like one of those people that attempted to, but never did. And so I'm kind of interested in exploring maybe possibly the, the way that John Glenn's political career could have, reading the book and then seeing kind of that whole aspect a little bit more that I think that the project that the girl was working on and then the podcast, I'm like, hmm, these are kind of serendipitously yeah. happening at the same time. So maybe I'll check this out. <laughs> I think that is the perfect answer to that question is you encounter the thing. I, I could not have predicted, oh yeah, the uh, the political trajectory of John Glenn uh, after those base race. 
like, and the fact that there is enough out there for you to dive into that in a really interesting way, sparked by a student, but then supported by podcasts, which by the way, we're big fans of. And I don't know, I think we may have even mentioned space in one of our podcasts at one time. Uh, but yeah, researching those, th that, that is exactly, I think the answer someone was looking for <laughs> in terms of something that you encountered and you either could have ignored it, but now you're like, oh, if I have time, let me really get into to this. That's amazing. I don't know how to top that, Liz. I just have like a list of documentaries. <clears throat> I'm really, I get on these kicks and my husband always calls them deep dives because they'll be like, oh, are you on a deep dive of that? And it's like, yes, I'll be, I'll be down in a minute. Um, I really, I it just, I feel like this past year, I've seen a lot of holes in my learning and I want to fill them. And it's fun to watch documentaries. We actually watched Band of Brothers yesterday, like five episodes of it. Um, and I was watching the Pacific and for Memorial Day, I actually did a deep dive on family military history because I know my grandfathers were veterans in the Korea, but my great, great uncle died in the battle of Argonne forest. And it's, it's been an interesting deep dive to see, like, we have the insurance, like his life insurance that he signed. And then we kind of see the progression of, you know, he was killed and then they pay it out. And it was $5,000 in 1918. And I'm like, that actually, like for my family is a lot of money because they were farmers. Mm -hmm. But even looking at how the, um, the local newspaper talked about him and it's just like, I, I, I kind of, you know, I wrote a blog post about it, but then it was like, it's really interesting to me knowing and understanding what I do about World War One and World War II, and then seeing Korea as this like forgotten war, and then the, the media coverage of Vietnam, and, and just kind of how media coverage expanded through these wars. I think now I'm like, you know, and again, re-watching things like Band of Brothers, but even um, our last book club was on the Navajo Code Talkers. And as I'm watching the Pacific, I'm like, this isn't mentioned in it. And so it's these little pockets everywhere that I'm like, wait a minute. And I have, I have a book right here that I write things down to be like, Hey, if you have extra time or, you know, want to understand. But I think the cool thing about this job um, and about our YouTube page too, is, and the podcasts and whatever. And if you haven't listened to Fabric of History, you should. My daughter loves Fabric of History. I love it. She comes in and listens with me. Um, but as we get to work with all these scholars, and even if the scholars are, even, even if that's not their um, area of expertise, they still want to talk about it. And you just, you learn things or you get like, oh, you should read this book or you should talk to this person. And so I feel like I'm continuously on that spiral because that's just how my brain works. And because like both of you, I love history. I love learning about this stuff and, and doing all of that. So it was a very long winded way to say I have a list. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I think the, uh, I, I think we all in our some way have, have, you know, things we put pins in, in some way. Right. I, I do too. I, I, mine, mine is, uh, my deep dives is a, a uh, folder I have, a bookmark folder of, of bookmarks of websites that I, or like articles or things that I know past me, like I'm just not going to have time to really give this attention. But future me has a hundred things to read now <laughs> that are actually pretty interesting that are, you know, not about anything in particular. It could be about, you know, the way that violins were made in, you know, medieval times and, you know, things like this that are like, you know, why, why there were, why there were so many doodles of rabbits in medieval manuscripts is a, I'm looking forward to diving into that one because there's a lot of literature on that and just things like that. But, um, you know, when you say Liz, honestly, that is, that is one of the fun things about the scholars is getting to know them in our, in our programs. And again, when I say that, that's, it's not exclusive. If you come to one, you have lunch with them. If you're a teacher, you spend the day with these amazing people who are just as curious and eager and communicative as, as the teachers are to, to build upon each other uh, in terms of like, oh, have you read this? No, have you read? Oh yeah, I know that guy, you know, kind of thing. And it just becomes this real like cavalcade of, of suggestions that you just feverishly want to catch up on that. Um, I don't know. I don't think there's anything bad with deep diving when you're a history person. I think that's, it's called research. It's I think part of what we do um, for fun as well. So. Yeah. 
But as all things, uh, we have hit our 45 minute mark and it's actually quite sad because it's not only the end of the episode, but it's, it's time for summer. So I want to say thank you, Molly, for taking some time to chat with us. Uh, I hope this was enjoyable and that we get to chat some more. Um, and to Liz as well for, for us chatting. We'll continue to chat, and Molly, I'm sure we will too. And everyone out there, I'm sure we'll chat at some point. But what do you say we all take a little break and uh, move into summer mode, shall we? Fantastic. I want to thank everyone here uh, uh, in our conversation and everyone out there watching, whether or not it is live or uh, whether or not it is recorded version. You can, you, you're out there as well. We want to say hi. Um, and we want to just thank you for tuning in. Uh, if you liked this video, feel free and be sure to subscribe to the channel. We're putting out things all the time. We'll be putting out shows all throughout the summer all year round um we release new videos twice a week and all things u.s history uh we have videos on close reads of documents with primary sources we have interviews with the distinguished scholars we were talking about from around the country uh homework help videos are our great short but very clear and to the point um really for students to to kind of tackle some some great uh, events and, and ideas in history um for any of the things that we do you can check us out on facebook or twitter or instagram for updates on programs that are happening both digitally and in person throughout the summer and into the school year um and ways for you to get involved yourself if you're interested and you know uh there are lots of ways through through our cancel and reading and you can test lessons and 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 get really involved. Um, so long story short, even though we're transitioning to summer, we'd love to hear from you. Um, you can comment your thoughts on this video below uh, or get in touch with us through social media using the hashtag BRI Teacher Time or through any of our social media handles. So on behalf of the Bill of Rights Institute, um, may I say, have an excellent summer, everybody. Thanks.